Welcome to Fighting the Butterflies and giving your first Postgres conference talk. So this talk is not just based on theory. I'm a Postgres speaker, I've organized some conferences, and I've also served on several talk selection teams as well. And I'm curious how many of you have already given a Postgres conference talk. Show of hands. Oh, that's awesome. All right, and I'm also curious, are any of you thinking about maybe someday possibly doing it? And as you think about it, does that idea give you butterflies, I wonder? Or maybe you have one of those evil gremlins that sits on your shoulder and whispers things in your ear like, you're not good enough, or you don't have anything interesting to share at this point yet. Well, whether you have to fight butterflies or gremlins, I think you have to have incentives. And so we need to start with why. So let's explore why fight the butterflies, as well as how to come up with ideas and how to get accepted. And when it comes to giving a Postgres talk, there are three groups that benefit. The Postgres community, your team or your project, as well as yourself. And the first reason is kind of obvious, right? When you're teaching people something, they're learning. You're helping them learn. So that one's obvious. But then, if the talk is being recorded, like this one is, or maybe somebody in the audience blogs about it, then your talk becomes part of the library of materials on the internet that help people. And if you do it just right, maybe you can inspire somebody in the audience. And then in terms of helping your project, uh, some talks can be repurposed to be part of new hire onboarding, which is awesome. And a lot of times people come up to you afterwards and they give you feedback and those outside perspectives are invaluable. And then by shining a light on whatever the thing your talk is about, you can help new people discover that project or new users discover that feature. And then in terms of how it helps you, there's a phrase I love, which is writing is thinking. Because writing is hard, and that's because thinking is hard. But I think creating a conference talk that's coherent actually helps you clarify your thinking as well. And it can give you and your work visibility and can even help your boss put together a case to promote you. As to how to come up with ideas, uh, everybody has a different creative process. And some people do their best thinking with pen and paper, and other people do their best thinking in the shower. And regardless of where you do your thinking, I think the key is to give yourself permission to come up with really bad ideas. Um, don't expect the first or the second or the third idea you come up with to be any good. So where do you find ideas? Well, the first thing I would say is write them down when you think of them, because ideas are pesky little buggers, and sometimes they slip out of your memory and they slip right through your fingers. Also reflect on what you're expert in, because you're probably already expert in something. And so you've got to figure out what that is. And here are eight types or categories of different Postgres talks. And of course there's more, but I wanted to give you a few angles that you could think about in coming up with talk ideas. And you can give a talk about something you learned or something that happened to you, or maybe a question you've been struggling with, or maybe you find yourself giving the same answer to a question over and over again. I gave a talk earlier this week at Nordic PG Day that was a beginner's guide, and LFMF stands for Learn From My Failure. And sharing a failure story can be a fabulous way to bond with an audience. As to how to get accepted, uh, the first tip is do your homework. Go take a look at last year's and past schedules to see what talks were accepted. And don't just look at the topics, but look at the details and the specificity in the abstracts and see how they set people's expectations as to what the takeaways of the talks would be. Um, you should also not make the talk selection team wonder what your talk is about. Don't make it a mystery. Um, it's really sad to get a proposal that just has two sentences and where there's not enough there there to understand what the talk will cover. And then remember that your proposal has two audiences. There's the talk selection team, but there's also all the people who you want to attend your talk. And meetups can be a great way to build a track record, to build experience, and to test drive ideas that you have. And new speakers are welcome and encouraged in all the Postgres talks that I'm familiar with, so don't let that be a stopper. And then I want you to know that the CFP is open right now for Posette until April 7th. It's a virtual event I'm involved with, so be sure to check it out. And then, should you fight the butterflies? I hope you find the answer to be yes. 
if you have a few minutes, take a picture of this QR code. It's a survey, it's very short, it'll help me with some projects that I'm working on. And I brought about 60 pairs of these really cool socks to give us thank yous, plus some activity books for people um, who can come find me during a break. Thank you very much. <laughs> How'd I do? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in these five minutes, I'm going to explain you how, which, uh, well, which choices we made to build an architecture to deploy thousands of uh, PG clusters almost every month. Uh, so, for, sorry. Um, my name is Leon Bekant. Uh, I'm CTO and co founder of Scalingo. Scalingo is a platform as a service uh, hosting company and database as a service hosting company, doing especially PGSQL uh, cluster hosting. So, first, fasten your seatbelt. I'm going to show you with a couple of diagrams uh, the different technical choices we have done to deploy our PG. Uh, clusters. So first, we have done the choice to use Patroni to handle replication and automatic failover you know, between our, the different instances of our PG for each cluster. Uh, Patroni is backed by ETCD in our case, which is handling the, the quorum to, to ensure that there is only one state and one source of truth. Um, on the backup side, we have been using PG backrest to uh, take the wild segments and upload them to a S3 compatible storage, as well as uh, the base backup from uh, PGSQL. Um, for the networking part, to handle also some high availability uh, between, uh, to, uh, to access the database, we have some HA proxy gateways, which are here to be always configured to target the healthy leader instance of the cluster. And those HA proxy instances are backed by a virtual IP, which is always targeting the HA proxy, which is the one which is healthy. So at each point, the goal is to have redundancy on the networking part and then the storage part. Concerning storage by itself, uh, we had this constraint that we wanted to propose several, several tiers of performance, several tiers of uh, databases, uh, including really small PG deployments and really large PG deployments. So for the very small one, we, uh, we took the, the decision like to mutualize storage and we used uh, LVM-based stack to, to, to create virtual blocks storage for the, for the different instances. So each instance has its own logical volume, the LVs you're looking here, which is encrypted with a dedicated encryption key for each uh, PG instance. So thanks to this kind of setup, we, are, we have something which is really flexible because for each uh, PostgreSQL database, we are able like, to scale the size of the LV dynamically as well as the performances, the, the performance, the IOPS that we are giving to uh, any database uh, which is deployed. Uh, on the networking part, each cluster is uh, in its own private network, where we are using some kind of overlay network based on v VXLAN uh, technology. So here on this diagram, you can see that there are like vertically five different servers and uh, horizontally two private network. And so on the first private network, there is one cluster. And on the second one, there is a second cluster. And in each cluster, all the databases have exactly the same IP address map. Uh, and they don't see each other. They are not able to interact with each other. And they are completely isolated from, from each other. Uh, to do this, we developed a technology named SAND, uh, which is a um, scanning awesome network daemon, actually. Um, and it, with all those pieces, are we satisfied with the kind of architecture uh, we have now? 
Actually, last year we started 30,000 PG SQL databases, uh, short or long lived, with or without HA, uh, high, avail high availability, multiple sizes of databases, multiple amount of nodes, and it has been uh, working smoothly. Uh, on the storage part, the biggest databases have uh, around 12 terabytes of storage per node, and so the system based on LVM worked quite well for that. And so far, it has been running in production for five years, and we go we improved it years over year to, pro to provide more features to, uh, to our customers. So to sum up, with these technologies I've named, we had the replication high availability on one side, the backupping part, the networking part, the ability to be dynamic on the storage part, and above all, our customers, they just have a host and port uh, couple to connect to the database, and everything about redundancy, failover, is hidden behind, behind the virtual IP that I've named first. So to do this, uh, we used several tools which were developed maybe by some of you. So thank you to the wonderful PG community. And uh, thank you for listening to me uh, in this presentation. Thanks a lot, Leo. Okay, so, oh, I brought my crutch and I've left it there. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you why you don't need a database backup policy. And I can already hear you thinking something along the lines of, don't be ridiculous, Karen, of course I need a database backup policy. Although you're probably using some more colourful language. So, just so we're all on the same page, what exactly is a database backup policy? It probably says things like the methods and the tools that you're going to use to take your backups, how often you're going to take different kinds of backups, where you're going to store your backups, and how long you're going to keep them. But how and why do you make all of those decisions? Well, it's not just for the fun of scheduling some extra processes or to use up your storage quota. Your data are probably critical to you, and you want to know that they're safe and available. So I'm assuming, therefore, that you take backups because you want to recover your data if you have something go wrong. What could that thing be that goes wrong? Fire? Flood? Explosions? <laughs> Tornadoes? Hopefully, usually nothing quite so dramatic, but it could be one of all sorts of different things, from a data center being unavailable, to a storage array failing, uh, to Bob dropping an important table, to a batch process incorrectly modifying data. In each of those scenarios, if you don't have another way to survive the failure, you're probably going to need to recover your database from a backup. Don't forget, though, that backups aren't the only way to safeguard your data. Uh, a recovery from a backup is often a last resort. You can actually survive many failure scenarios by having an, a high availability architecture in place. You've got replication to one or more standby databases that can take over in case there's a problem with your primary database. OK, so um, you know you need to be able to recover your database, but if you're in a recovery situation, you need to know exactly what's expected of you. So what do you need to think about? First, RPO, or recovery point objective, you need to know the maximum amount of data that you can afford to lose. RTO, or recovery time objective, tells you how quickly you need to be able to recover. How long can your database be unavailable before it starts to be a problem? And also retention, how far back in time do you have to be able to go? Or how long do you need to keep those backups? So once you've got your recovery requirements sorted out, what else do you need to think about? We need to know who's responsible for each aspect of this. You need to know who's going to be contacted in an emergency. You need to know um, who's going to sign off on any action. And since database recovery is only one part of disaster recovery, you're going to also need to know who to coordinate with in other teams. Uh, for each possible failure scenario you can think of, you need to consider the impact that would have on your business, on your database and your application, and the exact procedures that you need to um, follow to get back up and running. And finally, once you've done all that, you can start to think about backups. What backup strategy do you need to put in place to respond to these requirements? 
this starts to look a lot like a database disaster recovery policy. You need to make sure this is documented and you need to make sure it stays up to date so that it's always relevant. So many different things can change over time from your requirements to the tools available to the people responsible for different things to the size of your database, etc. And there are a couple of extra things you need to think about. You need to add in monitoring for your backups. You need to know your backups are happening as expected. You need to know how big they are, how long they take, how much space you have available, how much wall you're archiving. You want to know about and fix any issues before you need to do a recovery. And you need to test your recovery processes. Partly because the only way to know any particular backup can be recovered is by recovering it. And partly because you don't want to be trying out your recovery processes for the first time in an emergency situation. You want to have done it many times before. You want to know exactly what you're doing and how long it's likely to take. So your backups are only there to support your database disaster recovery. First, make sure that you've got well-documented and defined recovery requirements, and then put in place a high availability and backup strategy that responds to those requirements. So I maintain that you don't need a database backup policy. What you need is a database disaster recovery policy. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay. So, a slightly more literal interpretation of a lightning talk, <laughs> uh, and nothing Postgres related unless you like Slonic, uh, and obviously we all do, right? So this is uh, about some LED badges I made. Uh, and specifically, where on earth did all this start? Well, kind of like art decory type stuff, and I saw this little nice pendant, and I thought, hmm, that could be a PCB. <laughs> so I did. Um, and then I thought, hmm, well, I like Postgres as well, so let's start thinking about making an elephant. So how do we make all this work? Well, obviously, there's a little microprocessor on there. It um, has a whole 2 kilobytes of memory and 16 kilobytes of, of flash. Running at a whole 1 megahertz, right? You know, high performance. You can definitely run Postgres on that, right? Um, and we've got like 60-odd LEDs. So how on earth do we make all that work? Well, we have to wire them in what we call a matrix so that we can actually turn each LED on and off individually. Um, and that's all, you know, fairly easy. And now, how do we actually make something that looks nice? Well, got to start off with designing the graphics. And there's a lively open source program called Inkscape that's great for this. Um, so design all this. And so the colors come from a few different things in the PCB. So the black comes from what we call a solder mask in the PCB. So this is effectively paint that covers the copper to stop it degrading. The gold comes from actually gold-plated copper. So we expose the copper in particular areas and gold-plate it. And then the white comes from the silk screen, which is what we'd usually use for like component labels. So once we've got the idea, well, now I need to do all the layout and put all the LEDs on it, and then do all of the routing and get all the wires wired up. Um, and that's all fun as well, because you can't go across those nice bits of exposed copper. And then we know, look, this is what it's going to turn out like once I made it all. So how do we go about making it? Well, first off, you know, PCB houses don't want to make a little round thing, so we need to turn it into what we call a panel. So we go and stick a couple together, um, put all what we call mouse bites on so it all snaps out easily. Then it just means you've got to sand them all down afterwards. Um, and then we spend some money, send them off to China, and we get back <laughs> um, a board that's got a load of LEDs soldered on because they're a nightmare to do by hand. Don't want to do that, especially not 60, across the 100 or so I've done. So I then I end up with a whole bunch of these, um, and now we've got to kind of like actually turn it into a real thing and make it work. Um, which is me hand soldering some of the stuff on. So the very first version, I hand soldered on the switches. That was a pain in the ass. Uh, and then PGD UK, I made uh, 60 odd of the things. And then you've got to program them, right? And what software are we going to stick on them? Well, that's basically how all the patterns are stored. But you know you don't want to sit and write that manually, right? So effectively, it runs a little opcode interpreter in engine. So there's a whole like mini 
uh, set of for a single byte encoding, it can turn on and off each uh, any of those LEDs in that grid. And then as I expanded it over time, and it's maybe got a bit more complicated. And so the first version of this just used C preprocessor macros. And then I thought, right, well, you know, this is not complicated enough, right? So let's write an assembler. <laughs> So, yep, Saturn designed effectively a mini assembler language to define all the patterns in these things. <laughs> I get bored. <laughs> and then I thought, well, you know, like, nobody wants to sit and write this code, right? So let's build a nice little web interface where you can just click the buttons and it generates the code for you. And you can simulate it and test it. So uh, I wrote a whole, basically, another opcode interpreter in JavaScript to run in the browser uh, just to make this all easier. And there we go. Thank you very much. Uh... Thanks, Chris. And there you go. Good. Um, hello, hello, bonjour. My name is Matt. I'm a solution architect working for Ivan and today in Paris. I would like to talk about I would like to talk about cheese. Cheese, of course, but also Postgres. So the goal of the next five minutes is gonna be simple. Based on my favorite cheese, I want to find three other cheese that I could like. So to do that, we're gonna use a cheese table. So I gathered some uh, data on a website called cheese.com. Yes, this is a real website. And I gathered a table where we can find, for example, the name of the cheese, obviously, the origin, but also the texture and the description. The description is basically uh, how the cheese is made, where it's made, uh, some information about uh, the flavor and many other stuff. So the first thing that would come to mind where I find uh, a similar uh, cheese uh, on, in, on this table is, for example, look for some uh, words. So for example, we could look at some words, look just some, some, for example, the smooth or the creamy one. And that could work. Uh, actually, we could do some uh, full text search or something like uh, a basic like uh, queries, just like this one. So for example, here I'm looking at uh, all the cheese that has smooth, cow, and um, strong in the description. So that will give me a result. Yes, sure. But are those results accurate? Well, the answer is probably not. Not because, uh, first of all, even if I, I, I like a cow cheese, that doesn't mean I will love all the cow cheese. Uh, another problem is, even if I look for strong cheese, that doesn't mean in the description I will have every single time the strong word. It could be a synonym, for example, heavy or important. So obviously this will not be accurate and I might miss uh, some good information. So we're gonna use something a little bit more clever using AI and something called embedding. What's an embedding? It's a vector representation of data that captures semantic relationship between words. Basically, what it's going to do, it's going to understand the meaning of each word. It's going to make understand the relationship between those, understand why they are used, and based on all of those data, it will build a vector. A vector is basically an array of floats, just like this one. And hopefully on Postgres, we have a very great extension that is called PG vector that allows us to manipulate those kind of data. So basically, this extension is really simple to use. Yep, yep. Uh, inst after, uh, after installing it, you have a very uh, simple uh, data type to use. It's, it's called Vector1. Uh, and if we go back on our project, what we're going to do next is go we, we're going to calculate the embedding of each cheese description. We're going to put those uh, embedding inside Postgres. Um, just quick info for the embedding, you could use any uh, machine, learn machine learning model that you want, for example, uh, in any uh, on Hugging Face or OpenAI. And voila, we have a table with all the cheese uh, that has ever been made. We have the description of those, but also an embedding of each description of the cheese. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do some similarity search query. So we have access to a new operator using PG vector, which is this one. And for example, in this query, I'm going to compare the embedding of the Sanecter to all the embedding of all the other cheese. And this is it. I found the three other cheese that I've, I was looking for. We just have to taste it now. <laughs> Thank you. Just quickly, it was a quick and uh, very short introduction to AI in Postgres. If you want to have more information and go deeper, I gave a similar talk at PGConf Europe. Uh, just here is God. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there you go.
Here we go. Hello, everyone. I think I'm the only speaker whose name is longer than the title. <laughs> Let's fix that, make the font bigger, right? Um, so, uh, I'm here to try and convince a few more of you to use the buffers parameter when you use explain analyze. Uh, so, fingers crossed I can do that. Uh, I have some strong opinions on this. I work on a tool for visualizing explain analyze and explain analyze buffers. Uh, I've been doing that for a few years now and also co-host a podcast where this is one of our favorite topics. Um, a few of you have kindly told me you've already heard this a million times. Um, so, what are buffers? Uh, it's one of the parameters for explain. Uh, I don't know why it's so far down that list, um, but here's, like, here's how to use it. So, instead of explain analyze, you can put, you have to use little parentheses, it makes you feel fancy. Um, but yeah, look at that guy's face. That's how you want to feel, right? So, yeah, it, just as a quick like, overview, you can get the data read or written by, the, by like, each operation in the query plan. So that can be incredibly useful. It's, a, it's like an integer, a number of data pages, and you can convert it to bytes by multiplying it by your block size, which is almost always eight kilobytes. That's the default. Um, you'll see it represented in two words. So shared hit, for example, or shared read. They're the only two we need to know for today. Um, shared means it came from regular table or index. Hit means it was found in Postgres's cache or shared buffers, you might know it as. Um, shared read means, again, table or index, but found not in shared buffers, so via the operating system, maybe the cache, maybe from disk. So why, like, when should you use them? I think almost always, like, if you're doing performance op like optimization work, I think you'll save a lot of time by using these. You'll spot issues much more quickly if like in certain cases, but also I know a lot of your speakers, uh, you blog a lot, please use it in like your educational content as well, even internal things. I think it really helps explain to people like performance work isn't magic. We're not magically making, th making things faster. We're normally making it more efficient. We're normally reading less. So I think it really helps explain that. There is a tiny overhead. Uh, I haven't been able to measure it myself, but of course we're doing a slight bit of extra work. Um, and it does make the output a little bit longer, but I don't think it's, I think the pros massively outweigh the cons. So some evidence. Here's like the simplest example I could think of. Um, primary key lookup, like if without buffers, I've, I've taken them out for now. Um, this was nearly a millisecond. Okay, sure, super fast. But another execution of it is nearly an order of magnitude faster. Why? Like I'm sure a lot of you can guess. This is a very simple example. But with buffers, we can actually explain to people why it was faster. Like, in this case, we, we only had to read four blocks, but three of them potentially had to come from disk or weren't, weren't found in shared buffers. Whereas in the faster execution, all four were found in shared buffers. That's a really easy way of explaining to somebody why if their query's fast in one case and not in another. Exhibit B, this is the infamous uh, slow count in Postgres. Like, we know, we know count slow, but why? I think you can, you can get people to understand that reading 10 million rows is, is going to take some time, but I think it's a lot easier to explain why reading 600 megabytes takes. And it was actually becomes impressive, it's, it's like in a second. So that's, they're the kind of main reasons. Uh, so to recap, it shows you data read or written. Uh, it helps explain why things are slow. You can convert to bytes, and I think that really helps others understand, especially when you're teaching them. Uh, and yeah, you can use it by just some extra parentheses. Uh, loads of places where you can learn more. Uh, the documentation is good, but only includes one example with buffers. Um, I've documented a ton more um, in the glossary I did a while back. We did a podcast episode on this, and there are patches to include buffers by default with Explain and Analyze. Uh, they keep hitting snag, so if anybody can help contribute to that, uh, I'll owe you a lot of beers. Um, and the slides can be found there, Paris 24. That's me. Thank you. Uh, next. Next and last? Yeah, next and last. Next and last. Whoa, wait. You should do it the right way around. All right. Um, 
I am super glad that the organizers uh, asked me to do this lightning talk despite the ominous title. Um, the way I explained it to them was that, you know, like we're open source depends on the time that friends and strangers are the, uh, you know, on the internet are willing to invest uh, in it. And I wanted to explore if the Postgres project has such a generous group that will continue to invest in it uh, and to worry about that for like five minutes right now. Um, my name is Floor, I'm based in the Netherlands. I do all of the things on the slide, but we have five minutes, so I'm not gonna go over it. Um, instead, we're gonna look at the state of open source software. So 90% of companies use open source in their stack, and that's from an Open UK report, but I think it's a very conservative number. The number is actually pretty much, uh, is, is, is higher than that. And then FOSS constitutes 70 to 90% of software solutions, all modern software solutions, that's from a Linux Foundation uh, report. 89% uh, contains open source that is more than four years out of date. <laughs> yeah, that's from a synopsis uh, report on cybersecurity. 84% uh, of maintainers, or sorry, 84% uh, contain at least one known vulnerability. That's not great. 44% uh, of maintainers are solo maintainers. This is from a tight lift report on the state of open source maintainers. 58% uh, uh, have considered quitting the projects that they're working on and then 22% have actually quit the project they're working on. Um, so Simon Riggs in his PGConf EU um, keynote, if you've watched that, uh, celebrated that you know, Postgres is now the most popular database uh, in the world it's from Stack Overflow survey. Wonderful, congratulations. But just because something is popular doesn't mean it's not at risk of going away, right? And then for the younger audience, maybe. <laughs> And then, you know, like, also that Boris gets the joke, because I feel I didn't want to leave him out. So, um, 2023, if it proved anything, it proved that corporate budgets are very fickle, right? So, like, priorities are fickle. Um, and one thing that was maybe, like, sounds like something really good, $12 million have transpired from companies directly to FOSS projects in 2023. If you divide that 12 million over our entirety, like the entirety of the dependency graph, that's not a lot of money. Oh, like compare that to the money that you want to earn for your, for your, you know, to make your living wage, right? Um, that's not a sustainable model, right? Um, open source is only being funded by for like a really, really tiny fraction of what it is, and companies are not stepping up to like fill that void. Not really. Um, most maintainers are absolutely unable to fund the work that they do unless a company actually hires them to do it, right? Um, that is contrary to a very popular myth that maintainers don't want to be paid for the work they do because, you know, that way they're more hardcore. Most of us actually want to get paid for the work that we do. Maintainers are just like other people in that way. So money makes the world go around, people make the world go around too. Like we depend on the continuity of people like working on the Postgres project, right? We, we depend on that uh, to make sure that we, the project develops in a way that is in step with what industry demands. Um, the Postgres community itself is a very homogenous group, if you ever looked around. Um, so these calculations are from a week ago, and also I don't know how people self-identify, so my assumptions might be a little bit off, and I'm sorry. But Postgres core, seven out of seven people on that are white dudes, right? Major contributors, 39 out of 41 are dudes. Contributors, 91 out of 94 are dudes, again. So core contributors uh, pick the next core contributors, so that's sort of a cycle that is probably gonna repeat itself, right? Because people hire people in their own image. Um, also, it's entirely unclear how you can make it from contributor to major contributor and up. The contributors don't take into account any other contributions than code contributions either, so not great. Maintainer burnout is a real thing. Uh, lack of succession planning in the Postgres projects or figuring out how you can aspire to become a major contributor or a contributor in the first place is unclear. Um, and that's really difficult for a newcomer coming to the project, figuring out how they can make, you know, like put their stamp on the project or how they can make a contribution to the project. Um, and then like try and parse the wiki for the Postgres project. It is really, really hard. And we put a lot of the emotional labor of a newcomer coming to the project and figuring out in what way they can bring value to the project on the newcomer. So uh, one quote from the mailing list culture, which is more very rich calling that culture, um, is that the communication style is known to be pretty aggressive, but you know, that you should, that's par for the course when you're new to a community. 
and I'll wrap up, because you're asking, what can I do to change this? Well, companies hiring people to work on the pro project is, is a good way, right? So definitely check out Eddie Gerd's uh, FOSDEM talk on how to make sure that your company gets involved in the Postgres project. Um, and then also by being really kind, maybe, on the mailing list. That's an idea for a start. Thank you very much.